Um, Peter Fong's interests are in genitourinary uh, translational research, particularly uh, to do with castrate-resistant prostate cancer and also in drug development and gynaecological cancer. At present, Peter is the genitourinary tumour team leader um, in the medical oncology at uh, Auckland District Health Board. He's also part of the gynaecological tumour team and phase one drug development team. Uh, Peter is a principal and co-investigator in several studies, including phase one to phase three trials in castrate-resistant prostate cancer, in renal cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, endo endo endometrial cancer, cervical cancer trials, as well as some investigator-led studies. He's a member of the Auckland District Health Board Research Review Committee, which approves all clinical trials run through the Auckland Hospital. Peter is a journal and grants reviewer and is on trial management committees. He's given talks in numerous national and international meetings, has been an investigator in over 80 clinical trials, of which 50 are phase one trials and nearly 10 to do with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Just speaking with Peter um, in, the, uh, in the break, he tells me that he's one of probably only two uh, medical oncologists in Auckland who really specialise in prostate cancer, so we've got the man here to talk to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Graham. That'll be a hard act to live up to, I think. Uh, um, look, thank you for inviting me here today and uh, giving up your Saturday afternoon. I'll try to make this within the 20 minutes I've been allocated to. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, that's great. I think to talk about pathways of care for oncological treatment for prostate cancer will probably take 20 hours rather than 20 minutes. So I'll try to focus on what I do, which is the medical oncology side of things. You can ignore all these things, is what I've done in the past, so um, I, I think uh, you, you know you painted me in a better light than what I normally do. But I guess what, what I wanted to, to, to come up you know, at, at the very beginning is to talk about what CRPC actually means. And I guess the word castrate is not a very nice word to, to throw around. And, but then it, it actually gets across what the scientific understanding of it now in 2014 actually is for you know, prostate cancer that has escaped hormone control. And essentially you can see that there that you have got progressive prostate cancer despite very low levels of testosterone in the blood. I've put this slide up so that we can paint the journey in a graphical manner where you can see in the vertical line how much tumour a patient has and zero is good, too much leads to ultimately death I'm afraid. And going on the timeline, which is the horizontal line at the bottom, you can see that there are so many different scenarios that a patient may or may not find himself in. You may go through all of it or part of it and I guess it is important to realise that we're all on this earth for a limited period of time and as you've heard from Professor Lawrence, and you may get run over by a bus rather than dying from your prostate cancer. But there are different scenarios that you can see in the sort of yellow and red where the cancer is actually responsive to hormone control and not so responsive to hormone control where the cancer may have been localised and dealt with effectively by people such as Andrew Leinert, or unfortunately the cancer had spread beyond the prostate to the bones, say, for example, either at diagnosis or subsequently. And you can have people who even have prostate cancer that has spread but feel jolly good and didn't really know about it until someone came along and did a PSA test on them and a bone scan and told them the bad news. Or you can have someone with prostate cancer that's in the bones and is causing a lot of pain and suffering. And I've deliberately left out the numbers in there because I think numbers do no justice to us. Okay, what we can do is we can always talk about statistics about how long patients can live. But the individual sitting in front of me in the consultation room is an individual and, you know, may do a lot better, hopefully, or a lot worse. So that is a continuum that we deal with. And I think a lot of talks that you know, I've heard people give before have focused on things like screening, early stage prostate cancer, 
the things that probably affect most of, you know, I guess people's friends and families that you know of, you know, uncle so-and-so had prostate cancer and lived for 30 years. Um, but approximately, you know, depends on what worldwide figures you want to quote, 20, 25% of people will come to grief with their prostate cancer. And that's not, you know, that's not a small part. And that's a part that I, I guess I feel more passionate about, and which is what I'm going to address today. And, and that's the part that I guess doesn't get a lot of limelight, uh, mainly because I think it's drowned out in the fact that there's a lot of what I call inconsequential prostate cancer out there. And I think that's the important part because that's the part that gives a lot of suffering. And can we do something better about it? So the teams that are involved in looking after prostate cancer are, you can see up there, the urologists like Andrew, radiation oncologists not represented here, but there are quite a few, and the medical oncologist who is kind of like the newest kid on the block. Um, you all know what we all do. Um, I've been told I poison people, which is true to a certain extent. Um, not maliciously, I must say. Um, and I think in early stage disease, the urologist and the radiation oncologist who have been at the forefront of treating prostate cancer for many decades are really important. But in advanced stage disease, I think the role of the medical oncologist cannot be ignored. Okay, there was no established medical oncology prostate cancer practice to about 2009 in Auckland, I must say. So as I said, you know, this is the 20, 25% of people who suffer. And we're talking here about, unfortunately, not cure. Cure means all cancer gone, never comes back ever again. It's about disease control. It's about quality of life. It's about prolongation of life. And hopefully we can make it into a chronic disease. Hope's always there. And it is a team approach, and I think a team approach is really important because we all bring strengths into this area. Um, I don't pretend to know how to operate. I do not pretend to understand too much about radiation treatment. I like to think I know a little bit about drugs, um, the legal ones that are. Um, and, and there are a whole swath of people involved in looking after the patient who has advanced prostate cancer, which I've listed down on the right-hand side. Um, and to actually put down the role here of palliative care in supporting the patient's journey, especially, you know, towards the end. And, and the, the, the role of the family, okay, which cannot be underestimated. So what options do we have in advanced prostate cancer? We all know about hormones. ADT is your Zolodex or Lucrin or Eligard or whatever you normally use. And it's iterations, which you can combine with anything else radiation treatment, combining other hormones into the treatment of prostate cancer, chemotherapy, which is sometimes a very bad word to some people, bone targeting agents, which some of you are on, novel agents, which are looking exciting, especially over the last, I don't know, six years, clinical trials and research, which I'm very passionate about, and palliative care, which is a parallel stream all the way through. I just have a very limited number of slides about radiation treatment. In early disease, as Andrew said, we treat it for cure. Whether you choose to have radiation or surgery, you should discuss with your urologist or radiation oncologist. That's not what I'm here to talk about. And for quite a few people who have radiation treatment, you do get hormone treatment for example, 12 months of Zolodex, 1836, whatever. I can't understand that, so don't ask me any questions. In advanced disease, it is very useful. So for that hot spot on the bone scan that some of you may know about, um, radiation treatment is an area-directed treatment to sites that are sore. Essentially, your radiation oncologist will come along and you say, I've got this pain in my back. And he goes along and he hits it and you go, yo! And okay, that's the part that I'm gonna zap generally. Um, but we know that that's the part that was also hot on the bone scan, which tells us that you know the pain was from the cancer. And we can use radiation to treat it. We can also use radiation to treat other parts of the body that have expanded to quite a large size to the point that it 
upset the function of the rest of the body. Say if you've got a big mass of lymph nodes uh, pressing on the drainage of the urine from your kidney, that may not be a bad thing to do, to try to zap it. If you have a large prostate, that you know, even if you've got prostate cancer spread, you've got a large prostate and that's causing you trouble with urinating, then treating the prostate with radiation treatment can help to make you feel better and make the urine flow a little better. And as I said, it's very effective. The only, and it's been around for 100 years. The only problem is there is what I call a lifetime quota to what you can have to the same area. It may not make the cancer go away. Most of the time, it reduces the amount of cancer there, but it flares up again, and you may not be able to have radiation to the same area that worked so wonderfully well a year ago. That's the problem. So we need to do better. This is some nice pictures about the linear accelerator where you've got to lie on a hard coal bed and the thing moves around you and delivers high energy x-ray beams. Okay, and the little uh, picture at the bottom right is where the radiation oncologist determines what areas he wants to hit and what areas he doesn't want to hit with the radiation. You talked about bone scans and MRI scans. The bone scan is on your left, the MRI scan is on your right. The bone scan gives you your ghostly skeleton silhouette that you can see. And things that are black are not very good. So you can see that there's a few things on the skeleton which are blobs of black. And the one on the right is basically a, not to say a cross section, but a longitudinal section of the spine where you can see black blobs here in amongst the white. The spine looks like Lego. It should be white. There's a lot of black. Not good. So there's unfortunately cancer in there. So I guess in answer to some of the questions that have been thrown around earlier, we don't have the perfect test. We don't have the perfect scan. And I always call it that we live in an we have imperfect technology because we live in an imperfect world. I wish there was one scan that fits everything, but it doesn't. So we have to choose the right scan for the right moment. I, I put this in there because it's the number of FDA-approved chemotherapy drugs and some of the new targeted therapies that have come through since, you know, I guess 1949. Uh, nitrogen mustard was a chemotherapy thing that was found out back in the World War II. And we have, we have a lot of different chemotherapy drugs. We have a lot of different what we call new drugs or targeted agents. They're not all useful for prostate cancer, but I guess I put it up here to show that there are a lot of busy people trying to find ways to overcome cancer, and we're not really doing a very good job. But we are making some progress, especially in the last six years. So on the left-hand side, you can see that you know, since Charles Huggins discovered that, you know, uh, taking off the testicles helps people with advanced prostate cancer, that we've moved along, we've found, you know, injections like Zolodex that can treat prostate cancer, tablets that block the effect of testosterone on the prostate cancer, such as bicolutamide that you can see over there, hasn't been that long ago. And then the cytotoxics are what we call the chemotherapy drugs in blue, and the one that we have here is docetaxel, which I'll talk to you about. There are also drugs that support the patient's well-being along the way, what we call the bone targeting drugs. The years are where they were approved by the FDA okay, for use. And some of these new agents that we all talked about, like what Peter Williams QC is on, etc., things like abratrone and zolutamide, which are the main two that I'll talk to you about today. So there's been a lot of um, bad press about chemotherapy. I know a lot of patients come to me and they have their experience of chemotherapy, either through a family or friend. And I say, look, you know, there's so many different ones. Generally, we can give chemotherapy without too much upset. So, you know, it's good if we can have a discussion without too many biases already, you know, sort of formed in the mind uh, before we do that. And, you know, I, I believe we can do chemotherapy quite well without upsetting people too much. So in people of early stage disease, such as, you know, those that have been cured by surgery, 
radiation treatment. There's no proven use of chemotherapy as an add-on to improve your chances of being alive and well in the future. We do that for breast cancer, lung cancer, bowel cancer, etc., but not in prostate. We're not ready for it yet. Whether that will ever come, we don't know. But at this point in time, the answer is no. Now, let's move back to advanced disease, which is what I wanted to talk to you about. The mainstay of treatment for people with metastatic prostate cancer is the hormone treatment, the injections, such as the Zolodex or the Lucrin. When that doesn't work very well, the PSA continues to go up. People add the little tablet, biclutamide. It sometimes works. It works better for some people, doesn't work at all for some other people. Why? We don't really know. I wish I knew. There are some indications where whom it will work for, but we all tend to try it out because the hormone treatments have got very little side effects, so it's not unreasonable to do it. Okay. Secondary hormones are tend to reserve for later on, okay, when we have exhausted our other options, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So we talked about the goals of management of advanced prostate cancer, and that is for disease control, to manage the symptoms, and I think it's very important to realise that someone who has got a lot of burden of cancer in them, be it in the bones or the lymph nodes or liver or lung, have great side effects from the cancer. Um, it's quite interesting sometimes the patient sits in front of me, he's on lots of morphine, he's got a lot of pain, and he's only focused on the side effects of the chemotherapy that I've just told him about. I said, actually, that's true, but why don't you take a step back and think about how much the cancer is actually wrecking your quality of life? And if I can turn that around, then you know that may not be an unreasonable gain to actually try it. Okay, so uh, I guess it's mentioning the obvious, which is that you know cancer reduces your quality of life, probably more so than what chemotherapy might. So until 2004, that's about 10 years ago, there was no standard chemotherapy regimen. Um, then docetaxel came out. We just had it funded seven years late in New Zealand after I campaigned about it to Pharmac, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> With, with the whole group in, in New Zealand, obviously. And, um, and, and the urologists and the radiation oncologists have primarily been looking after the man with prostate cancer for a very long time. And, you know, he trusts him. Absolutely, I totally agree. Physicians, uh, which is medical oncologists, we are physicians, obviously, did not really want to use chemotherapy because we thought that it was awful, that it didn't benefit anybody. Um, that maybe the trials were, you know, trumpeted its benefits way too much. But I think the problem there is that we were using chemotherapy way too late. You know, when it was, you know, at the 11th hour, you're not going to turn a sinking ship back. We should have to use the chemotherapy earlier. And where I come from, earlier treatment, not too early to the point that, you know, if you're feeling jolly good, I wouldn't give you chemotherapy at that point. Earlier treatment, uh, with as many options as possible lined up in front of you, probably gives you the best outcome that we could have in a disease that is cruel and unfortunately relentless. Now, what do we have besides chemotherapy? I mean, the ones in blue are the drugs that are available. So if money is no object, you can buy them all. Okay? but they're not all available in New Zealand. So Cipolusil T at the top left-hand corner in blue is a vaccine called Provenge. You might have heard about it before. Abiraterone and enzalutamide are hormone pills. Alpharidin is a radioactive isotope that goes into the bone and try to take away the bone pain and control the cancer. Cabazitaxel is another chemotherapy similar to docetaxel chemotherapy but it seems to have mileage even after docetaxel chemotherapy has failed. Wow, with all that, shouldn't we make a big difference? Unfortunately, we don't make a huge difference. So, you saw the, the list there. Docetaxel is the only treatment that's funded in New Zealand. So if you are a Kiwi, it's free. Provenge costs you a cool quarter of a million US. If you want to do it, you need to spend about five weeks in the US. 
I think there might have been one person in New Zealand, New Zealand who went there. I'm not sure. Um, capacity tax or chemotherapy cost about I don't know eight nine thousand a shot every three weeks in private. Um, it's available if you want to buy it, but you got to go privately for it. Abratrone is registered. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, at this point in time, not funded by the government. Um, it is funded over in Australia for people who have failed chemotherapy. It's not funded in Australia for the people who haven't had chemotherapy yet. In New Zealand, it's not funded either way. Okay. Um, Enzalutamide is registered in Australia, not yet in New Zealand. Um, it's a tablet again. You can get it for about $10,000 a month, directly imported from the UK. And alpharidin, um, we can probably get it from Singapore, which is your closest you can go to. It probably costs you about eight grand every month. So I think that's out of reach of most Kiwis, I must say. And don't forget that whatever we're doing with these treatments is not going for a cure. It's hopefully to try to halt the cancer a little bit and get us um, some quality of life and some prolongation of life. And that's the plan. So what's abiraterone? So this is just a simplified diagram. How does it work? We get cholesterol converted to testosterone. It happens in the testes, in the adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys. And inside the prostate cancer, the bloody, sorry, I shouldn't swear, the bloody cancer cells are very clever because they know that you get the Zolodex, you take away more than 90% of your testosterone production in the body. The cancer say, well, I need to survive, so why don't I just make enough within the cell to auto-stimulate myself to grow? And that's what it does. Okay, so um, so that's the problem. And so abiraterone uh, interferes with the enzymes that you know that 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 address the peripheral conversion of some of the other steroid hormones into testosterone or its neighbors, which can then stimulate cancer growth. And zalutamide is a bit like the biclutamide or flutamide that you might have been on before. It blocks the action of testosterone on the receptor, which then goes into the cell, the cancer cell, and that makes a whole swath of proteins that make the cancer cell grow. So enzalutamide is supposed to be a better blocker than biclutamide. And all these drugs have been shown to work. Now that's a very busy table. It's not designed for you to read from the back of the room. I've just listed, just so that you can have a snapshot view of the big trials that have demonstrated survival benefit for patients with prostate cancer that is metastatic, that has gone, that has escaped hormone control. Okay? The top one is the docetaxel chemotherapy that some of you may know of people having, which we can offer in the hospital. That was back in 2004. And coming down to the bottom, which is the enzalutamide study, which is using it before the use of chemotherapy. And that was just published about two months ago in a very eminent journal. So those of you who want to read, the references are down below. I think it's important to show that actually, and I might be in trouble trying to compare prostate cancer to other cancers, but I'm still going to do it anyway. Because um, I think it hasn't received as much attention as some of the other cancers do. Uh, I think there's a lot of prostate cancer out there, but, a, but there's probably a majority of people with less consequential prostate cancer. Um, the men tend not to speak up very much, I think. By the way, because I look after gynecological cancers, I also look after women, so I think the men tend not to speak up as much as the women do. Um, and and I think it's time that you know they they have they have you know um, some options available for them and um, and and so what I'm saying here is that the magnitude of benefit of these new drugs are similar to the stuff that we do for breast cancer, bowel cancer, lung cancer, you name it. Okay. <coughs> I mean, for example, docetaxel chemotherapy was used for breast cancer and lung cancer for many years before we had it funded for prostate cancer. Go figure. Um, <coughs> the the magnitude of du the absolute duration of survival benefit. Now you may look and say, look, I only gain an extra four months, but think about that. For someone whose lifespan is curtailed very much by the cancer, that's important time. 
for someone who benefits from that drug, you actually do better than the four months because that is a pooled result of everyone, whether the treatment worked or didn't work. So if the treatment worked for you, you get a lot more than that, okay? So I think it's, it's important to, to actually stop being nihilistic about that, which is something I've sort of uh, you know, been campaigning um, quietly for the last five years. And these drugs all have been associated with quality of life benefit, okay? So are we actually making a difference? So I guess you know, I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, nostalgic to, to the London group that I work with. This is a graph. You just have to look at the blue bits, which is at the top end, and not the red bit, which is at the bottom end. The red bits are the statistical prediction of how long men should live. <coughs> the blue bits are the observed survival of the men who have had, I guess, the opportunity to expose to clinical trials of new agents. Some of these new agents subsequently shown to be winners, blockbusters, and managed to control the cancer, and so they lived longer. Now, as I said, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to go sometime. But if we can improve that and stretch it out, then I think we've done something. So, um, a, a, again, a plug for clinical trials and research, um, the success of new and old agents. Um, the reason why I say old is because some of you might have heard that the use of chemotherapy now, of docetaxel chemotherapy, has been extended over to men who have been diagnosed with metastatic disease, but still remaining hormone sensitive. Now, if you asked me this two years ago, I would say, I'm not going to give you chemo until you stop responding to hormones. But a new study that's been you know, uh, reported through the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, part of the Eastern Cooperative Group, showed that if we gave chemotherapy to people who had a lot of cancer at the beginning when they were first diagnosed, say biopsy, prostate cancer, bone scan, showed cancer everywhere, um, we actually helped them to live longer if we gave the chemotherapy earlier rather than later on. And the magnitude of difference was unprecedented, not seen in any other solid tumour treated so far in modern medical oncology. Just some food for thought. So I guess, you know, if a lot of these drugs that have met success in the, what I call end of the road situation, are moving backwards towards being used in earlier stage disease, Perhaps those who have PSA rise only, those who haven't got proven metastatic disease that the scans can see, and the use in hormone sensitive disease. So maybe we can be happy. I put this thing in there because you know we're hoping to try to understand the the molecular makeup of prostate cancer. If we can determine what are some of the driving mutations behind them, we might be able to find the Achilles heel. Uh, there's no lack of trying, I must say, and a lot of clever people out there. And perhaps we could find some, but for most people, we don't find it. There's got a lot of driver mutations behind them, and targeting one thing doesn't really help. Finally, um, what I've always been you know, quite, um, quite big on is the role of the multidisciplinary team. We've got a very good team in Auckland, can't, don't really know what the rest of the country is like, where the urologist, the radiation oncologist, and the medical oncologist sits together, and we talk about patients. Um, and I think, you know, I've drawn these lines arbitrarily, where I think the role of each specialty uh, will come to the forefront and go back into the background, depending on the stage of the disease the patient is in. And I think to help people to benefit greater, I would say that an early referral to a medical oncologist who can actually discuss some of the you know, intricacies of all the new treatments that are available might be quite useful. Now, I must say that you know, if someone is you know, 98 years old and has got bad heart failure and, and, you know, and emphysema, perhaps it looks pretty obvious that you know, they're not going to have chemotherapy. But for the vast majority of, of men, even though you might be 70 or you know, um, 80 odd years old, if you're very well, uh, we can perhaps put you through treatments that could help you. After all, it's a discussion. The final question that I, ha I, 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 that I put through, you know, to, to, through to all of us is, has this all made a difference to us? And you know, is having new treatments, chemothera treatment, chemotherapy treatments, is it really right for me? Well, I think it's a personal choice. It depends on what you want. 
and hopefully we can address these in a full discussion with you when we see you. So hopefully in summary, that I hope that I've painted a brief picture of the advanced prostate cancer patient's journey and the role of the oncologist. Um, didn't talk much about radiation oncology, but that of a medical oncologist. And, and the team approach, which I think has got a lot to speak for, and that our outcomes have and hopefully will continue to improve. And some of these new agents hopefully will, you know, you know, bring a ray of sunshine at some point. Thank you very much for your time.